Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 18 and 19. I don't know that I've ever, as many times as I've referred to this, I've referred to this verse many times as anybody who preaches or teaches, or even who is trying to encourage somebody. You've read it, you know it very well. Luke, the fourth chapter. Reading verses 18 and 19, this is in reality, this is a, a fulfillment of, of the prophecy given in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, verses 1 and 2. Jesus has returned to his hometown. Some people refer to this as the beginning of his public ministry, and that's really, that's not, that's not at all right. It's not even, not exactly right. Uh, you, when you read further down, obviously he'd been in Capernaum, and they heard about healings and miracles that were there. And, uh, and they had heard that he'd been down there teaching and preaching. Now, you might say this is his debut in his hometown, though. Since he's been a boy, he's, he's been away for some period of time. Some say maybe about a year and a half. So this is quite early in his, his public ministry. And, uh, and so he's, he's returned home. He's gone there to the local synagogue. And whether or not that this was a, you know, a, a particular building built, the truth is uh, any, any room where 10 adult men would come uh, to sit under the word and that there would be a rabbi there could be considered synagogue. But nonetheless, he's there and there's obviously numerous people there and significant spiritual ru uh, rulers in Nazareth there. And Jesus, it, the scripture says that there's delivered unto him the, the scrolls. And he finds the place where it is written in Isaiah. We call it the 61st chapter. You understand then they weren't broken to chapters. And he begins to read and he says, And the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Amen. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovering of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We well, do you know at first, you know, the, they kind of like what he reads at first. If you read right underneath there, they're, they, yeah, they, they say, wow, what gracious words comes out of his mouth. At first, they're all on board. All right? they, 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 they like what he's reading at first. Okay. Now, I want to point this out. It's a tremendous verse. I, you know, we're, we're going to refer to it several times over the next few weeks. It would kind of be what we'd you know, call it our, our text, our golden text. Now, in this verse, though, we see something. In this verse, we see that God loves us because of who he is and not because of who we are. See, so he doesn't love you because you're poor. And he doesn't love you because you're broken hearted. He doesn't love you because you're in prison. He loves you because of who he is. He is a loving heavenly father. Amen? Yeah. See, a love something you, you just choose to bestow on someone. I shared that with somebody here just not very long ago. You know, we're not loved for a particular reason. He set his love, his affection upon us. It's a value that somebody else places upon your life. He looks at these poor, these broken, these imprisoned, these sometimes sheep without a shepherd. He looks at these lost people and he says, and I have good news. Good news. Look at it says that you'll find, again, the scripture, you'll find, a, the Bible says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And, and you'll find that there is significant evidence con concerning this being a major role in Jesus' life. 
And here's the good news. It, it hasn't changed. Now look at Acts 10.38. Now in Acts the 10th, by the time you get to Acts 10th chapter, he's, he's the resurrected Lord. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, Hebrews tells us, ever living to make intercession for the saints. Here he is in Acts 10.38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed. Everybody would say oppressed. Of the devil. For God is with him. Amen. Now, when you look there, if you, I don't move backward very often, Mel, but move back for me all the way to, to, to Luke 4, our first slide. When you read through there, look at, we, we got people that are poor. We got people who are prisoned. We got people who are blind. And we have people who are oppressed. We got a list of needy people. Now, first of all, let me tell you that God didn't put them in this position. These people are suffering the consequences of living in a fallen world. Listen, you may be in that position today. And, and if you're in that position, it's because you live in a fallen world. And let me share this with you. It has much more to do with what you've done and not what, what God's done. Somebody say amen. amen. But again, see, there's good news here. It's not only true in Luke, the fourth chapter. So he stands up and he says, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Wow, and they said, wow, what gracious words comes out of his mouth. And again, we serve a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here's what Luke 4, 18 and 19 is. This is Jesus' mission statement for his ministry here on earth. It's his mission statement for his ministry here on earth. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, all right? God has anointed me. That word anointed means he's the Messiah. This is the one that he is the hope of Israel. He's not the hope of Israel. He is the hope of mankind. Amen. He's the anointed one. Anointed means you, you, you have been chosen for something special. When, when somebody would become king, they would get oil and they would pour it on him and it was signified. Yet they, they've been called for special service. They would anoint him with oil. Well, he's not just anointed with oil. This is not men pouring oil. This is not somebody pouring Crisco on somebody. He's been anointed with what? With the Holy Spirit. And he has come to fulfill a mission. He's anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. To preach deliverance to the captive. The recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those that are bruised or all those that are oppressed. This is his what? This is his mission. Listen. If you're here this morning, whatever your challenge is, it could be the past it could be pain, it could be rejection, it could be unforgiveness, it could be debt, it could be addiction, it could be pornography. Listen, he's on a mission. And that is to set you free. Yeah, it's not his plan that his people live in captivity. It tells us in John the 8th chapter who the Son sets free is free indeed. Oh, I like it. Free indeed. In what? Indeed they're free. Not kind of free. Free indeed. Jesus reveals what? There's hope and restoration for every broken life. Now you know that this is true, just the, 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 the physical part of it. Jesus did feed the poor, didn't he? Yeah. He fed the multitudes, the poor. They had to, you know, we know that they had a, a treasure. Judas wasn't, wasn't the best treasure in the world. Nonetheless, that was his job. And, uh, and, and so anyway, that, uh, uh, you know, he kind of took care of the money, and they would, they would help the poor, all right? So he did help the poor just in the natural sense, didn't he? He, he, he did teach us how important it was to visit those who were imprisoned, We know that he, he come to deliver and set people free. Remember the woman who had an issue of blood? He said, those whom Satan hath bound these, these many years, set her free. 
Remember Acts 10, 38? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all. Everybody say all. all. Uh, I like all, don't you? Remember, we did say there's, there, there's hope and restoration for what? For every. Why? Because he says all. Forever broken, forever broken life. In Matthew, the ninth chapter, verse 12. See, the good news is when you've got a challenge in your life, here's what Jesus said. You know, they, they, they would say, oh, look at him. Look at the, the kind of people he hangs around with. You might say he hangs around with people who've got problems. Look at somebody say, I got problems. Yeah, I want him hanging around with me. Yeah. Yeah, I'd make a problem up, get him hanging around with me. I don't have to make one up, though. But when Jesus heard that, he said it to them. They that are whole, don't, they, they have no need of a physician. You know what the deal is? It, that they, these... These real religious guys, all right? And this is not me mocking the church. Boy, I don't like that. I don't like people mocking the church. Yeah. There's a lot of churches today make a living mocking the church. Oh, we're not that church. Yeah. Yeah, we're not them real spiritual people. No, you... Uh, behave, Bill. I love the church. I love his people. And we got our problems. We got our own faults. But we're the body of Christ. Person, people all, you, you know the church is his bride? Let, let, let me just talk to you for a minute. The church is his bride. Don't listen to people who badmouth the church. The church is his bride. You talk bad about my wife, me and you are going to be, we're going to dance. Yeah. Well, I'm telling you now, again, there's way too much of that. Boy, I hope people who listen to some of that stuff are listening online. Don't listen to them kind of folks. This is the, the church. was. I don't care if it's a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Pentecostal church. I don't care what kind of church they are. They were bought with the precious blood of Christ. We should not mock, make fun, and belittle the church. You make a living doing that, you need to be unemployed. Jesus said, he said, you know, those that are whole. Who is that? Bingo. <laughs> they the whole don't need a physician. They think they're whole. But they that are sick. He's our forgiver. He's our healer. He's our righteousness. He's our peace. He's our victor. Our triumph. Why do we need somebody like that? Why? Because we're not whole. Right. Amen. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Luke 4.18. I like the way the Message Bible reads it. He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners. He what? He sent me to announce pardon to prisoners. Now, see, a lot of us find ourselves in places in life and we end up being imprisoned. We could be imprisoned by a drug. Somebody could be imprisoned by a habit, by the past, by an attitude, by unforgiveness. But see, the good news is he sent me to announce what? pardon to what to prisoners see whatever it is that holds you captive this is why he's come he's on what he's on a mission he's on this is his mission statement for his earthly ministry right? you know he's the god of heaven and earth in heaven he ever liveth to make intercession for the saints according to the will of god but on earth, this is, and remember in Acts 10.38, he's already, he's already risen. How God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. That was true then. I will show you another one in a little bit. But it's also true today. He's what? He's still announcing release for people who are imprisoned. 
See, the bound don't have to be bound no more. A prisoner is a person who is deprived of liberty. Deprived of liberty. Confined by various restraints. When I, obviously, you know, if you're sitting in some old dark cell, I mean, you think about back then, man, you know, I, these would look like, and again, anytime you'd lose your freedom, there's nothing good about it, all right? That, no comparison to the muddy, nasty, you know, disease-infested, wrath-filled places that these guys were thrown. A person deprived of liberty confined by various restraints. Well, see, this is not always about a physical prison. It could be an emotional prison. It could be a spiritual prison. A person is deprived of liberty. They end up finding themselves what? Confined. The restraints, oh, they're, they're various. They're various. You could have financial restraints. You could have, once again, you could have the restraint of unforgiveness. Remember, unforgiveness is a restraint. We'll, we'll talk about that in its, in its fullness. But in, in, in Matthew, the 11th chapter, when you stand and pray that if you have ought against any, forgive that your Father in heaven may also forgive you. All right? So if we do not forgive, we're not forgiven. What that's a restraint. A restraint. Can't move forward into the future because I'm restrained by my past. I can't get out in public because I'm restrained emotionally. But Jesus come to what? He's on a mission. Set you free. Bound by numerous and various, various kinds of sin. You remember it's various restraints. It says in Hebrews, therefore laying aside every weight and the sin that does so easily what Beset us. He's on what he's, he's on a mission. Pardon means this, to be released from prison. To be forgiven and no longer deserving of punishment. No longer deserving of punishment. See, mercy delivers us from what we deserve. Somebody say amen. amen. And then grace gives us what we do not deserve. Pardon is to be what? Released from prison. To be forgiven. No longer deserving of punishment. I realize it, it's, it's an easy case, you know, for the enemy to beat us up over and over again. Because we've made so many mistakes and what we have. And we just settle for, well, this is my lot in life. This is my bed. And I'll sleep in it. I'm going to tell you, the Lord's got a better bed for you to sleep in. He what? He's, he's pardoned us. He's forgiven us. He's delivered us and we are no longer deserving of punishment. See, when a, when a pardon is issued, this is wonderful. When a pardon is issued, liberties are restored. When a pardon is, you, you, I, I had a friend had some trouble some, some number of years ago. And, uh, and because of that trouble, he, uh, you know, he served significant time in prison. Truth is, he committed three felonies. And because of those three felonies, he served his time. He was eventually paroled. Good man. Probably a good, I said more to good man. He's a great man of God. Who he was and who he is is two different people. And when he got forgiven, he was forgiven. His sins, were as, they, though they were red as scarlet, they've been white, made as white as snow. He's fully, fully forgiven by the Lord. And, so, and the Lord's used him, I mean, in a great way, just tremendous. But you know what? He couldn't vote. Couldn't own a gun. Couldn't travel out of the country. Why? He lost his rights. Why? Because of prison. Prison takes rights from you. Same thing is true. Again, we, you, no need of going through the list of whether it be unforgiveness or the past or 
habits. Prison takes certain rights from you. But along, along the way, he has received a pardon. And because my friend has been pardoned, he now can own a gun. You say, well, that's scary. x fell and owned now. Well, you had to worry about this one. He can own a gun. He can vote. He can travel. Why? Because he's been pardoned. And the Lord has restored all his liberties. See, first he got his spiritual liberty back, but then he eventually got his natural liberties back too. See, God wants to pardon you. He wants to restore you to a place of freedom in your life. So, uh, this, this would affect so many people, and, and, and please, please excuse me for using this if this affects you, but it affects so many. Many people have been, they've been divorced and remarried. And there would be those that say, well, they're a divorcee. No. Not if you've been pardoned. Amen. Not if you've been pardoned. Your liberties have been restored. Now, you just to take that now and apply it to wherever you're at in life and that which you've lost because of where you found yourself. And sometimes, some of it of our doing, but sometimes we find ourselves, our our, our place in life, and it's not of our doing. We're born. You know, if you're born poor, you're just born poor. One man said, there ain't no shame in being born poor. He was right. No shame in that. God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Yeah. There's lessons wherever you're at in life, whether you're poor or you're rich or you're, many of us live somewhere in between. There's lessons to be learned in life we've got to overcome. If once again, what will the Lord do? He, was, he would restore something. We read once again Luke 4, 18 and 19. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. See, this is my mission. If you're anointed king, it is to lead a nation. Amen. If you're anointed as a priest, it is to, to offer up sacrifice and worship he said the spirit of the lord is upon me he's anointed here's my mission to brought to preach good news now see everybody who has trouble he's got good news for them he's got good news for the poor now that we understand we're not just talking about the poor financially we're talking about people who are poor spiritually poor spiritually revelation talks about you know that you're you're naked poor the Laodiceans, they, they just thought they were all we're, we're so wealthy. He said, no, you're, you're naked, poor, you're wretched. They were, spiritually, they, they, were, they were poor. They were impoverished. But he's got good news for the poor. He sent me what to, to once again, proclaim. He's declaring. He declares freedom. See, because he's, this is the one who can offer the pardon. I often pardon for prisoners. Now, again, you understand we're not just talking about natural prisons. Obviously, he's much more talking about spiritual things. There would be those that would use this context and they would use this for wealth redistribution. That's not what this verse is about. This verse is about setting the captive free. Good news for the poor. Proclaim liberty for the prisons. The recovering of sight for the what? The blind, the spiritually blind. They cannot see. You know, Jesus t- told, the, told the, the people one time, he says, you know, here's your problem. You've got blind guides. You're following people who can't see the truth. He's talking about the scribes, the Pharisees. You've got blind guides. Old Testament talked about those blind guides groping at the walls, trying to feel their way through. You know, as believers, we're not trying to feel our way through. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Quit following your feelings. He, 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 once again, he says there's a recovering of sight. For what? For the blind, you know? Open up our eyes. How, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, How the God of this world hath blinded their minds, lest they see and hear the light of the glorious gospel to shine unto them and then be saved. Recovering of sight to the blind. 
so we can see spiritual truth, so we can see Christ as the way, the truth, and the life, as we can see him as the Savior of the world, as we can see him as the way of the forgiveness of sin. Now he gets down here and he says he's going to what? To release the what? The oppressed. Again, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now that's real significant. The year of the Lord's favor. Now we're going to look in the Old Testament, but in the Old Testament when they were living, leaving Egypt, uh, uh, the Lord had given them certain instructions concerning the land and themselves. Now the year of the uh, Lord's favor is this, uh, it was called Jubilee. Now, Jubilee was supposed to be celebrated every 50 years, but here's the deal that Israel often didn't obey God, so there are many of things that came and went that they didn't do because there wasn't a lot of personal benefit in it. I mean, you read through the Old Testament, they ended up in captivity sometimes because they didn't let the land rest. Isn't that right? For six years, you worked the land on the seventh year to let the land rest, and you just eat and anybody can go in and get it in anybody's field Dennis all right your neighbor on the seventh year can go into your field anything that just comes up on its own they're welcome to it the the trap person passing through the country they, they're welcome to it the animal is welcome to it he says for six years you work the land God says you do this you do it right six years you work the land on the six years I'll give you enough for three years not two years three years Seventh year, you can collect what grows wild, but you, you let the land rest. All right? But after you do this seven times, seven times seven is 49. In the 50th year is Jubilee. Now, Jubilee is a much big deal, bigger deal than the seventh year that is the year of rest for the land. See, this is the year of the Lord's favor. It is a time of restoration and rest. Now, this, this gets good for us today, all right? Now, again, but Israel didn't practice this. I believe this is Bill's conviction. I often tell you I like my convictions, all right? I believe that it is literally the fifth, one of the 50th years when he gets up and read it. Because he says, this day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. He's not one to get it wrong. Right, sinless son of God? You know, perfection, there's only one name in the bunch. So he says, this day, this is fulfilled in your years. This is, in your ears, this is the year of the Lord's favor. It's a time of, now, this is why it's such a big deal for the poor. So if, here's the deal. During those 49 years, let's say that you got in a tough spot, Linda, and you went really deep in debt. Well, in that 50th year, you could get your family's land back. Yeah. And let's say that, because this is what often would happen, that during that 50-year period, and maybe if it's only happened the year before, maybe it happened at the very beginning, but let's say that you got into such trouble that you became what they called an indentured servant, same thing as a slave. And what you've got to do is show up and work. And show up and work. I mean, you've you, you got to be there every day. But in the 50th year... The poor are poor no more. They are what? They're restored. It's the year of what? Jubilee. See, Jubilee is a big time. People like ju Jubilee is a lot bigger deal than the 4th of July. And we like the 4th of July, don't we? My man, I like the 4th of July. I'm all about independence, liberty. God bless America. I love the 4th of July. Grateful for the price that so many paid. All right? And so we have what freedom when we have liberty in this country. So Jesus comes and he says, boy, this is, this is it. If you were poor, if you were in bondage, if you're in prison, let me read some of it. Leviticus, the 25th chapter. This is what he's talking about. Leviticus, the 25th chapter. Consecrate the 50th year. Proclaim what? Proclaim liberty throughout the lands. Now notice he says, I come to preach good news. Proclaim freedom for the captives. What is it? See, it's, it, nobody's, nobody's telling anybody. Why? Because there's no benefit in it for other people. He says, I come to, I got good news. 
He says, I come to proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be jubilee for you. Each of you return, all right, notice this, you return to his family. Why? Because if you've been a slave for 48 years, for 49 years, for four years, or four months, in jubilee, you get to go home again. You what? You've been pardoned. Your rights have been fully restored. You get to return to your family and property in each to his own clan. You return family property in each to their own clan. It's what? It's a time of restoration. But it's not only this. In Leviticus, the 25th chapter, in verse 11, it says this. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. Do not sow, do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the unattended vines. It's a year of what? Rest. Rest. Once again, there's, there, there's a lot of Sabbath principles in Scripture. Right? And it's important that we all, you know, practice Sabbath uh, resting. But ultimately, now catch this though. The important thing is, is that you understand that Jesus is our Sabbath. He is our rest. We'll look in Matthew. Come unto me, all you labor and heavy laden. All right? I'll give you what? Rest. They are to let the land rest. All right? First of all, they're supposed to do it every seventh year. Six years you work the land, seventh year, let it rest. But then in the 50th year, there's a rest, not only for the land, there's a rest for the people of God. And now, it's not only the slaves that are set free, but if you are in jail, you're pardoned. You are given a second chance. You say, wow, I don't know if that's fair. Well, how many of you has God given a second chance? Amen? Yeah. It's what? It's Jubilee. They've been what? They've been liberated. Set free. Do not sow, do not reap. It's a time of what? Rest. Matthew 11, 12. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. What? You're oppressed. You are burdened. You are heavy hearted. You have a broken spirit. What's he say? I will give you what? Rest. The Spirit of the Lord's upon him, anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor, sent him to bring deliverance to the captive, the recovering his sight to the blind, to set at liberty them to bruise, to preach the year of the Lord's favor. Now, here's a wonderful thing about the time we live in. For the people of Israel, once again, now mind you, they violated many of the principles and the statutes that God set up in Scripture. So we don't even know how often they practice these things as they should. So as a result, things would get out of, they'd just get out of place. I, I want you to know there's some truth in the church world today. If we would do things God's way, everything wouldn't be out of place. Somebody say, amen or oh me. So anyway, that we don't know how often they practiced it. And Jesus gets up and he proclaims to the people, this is a year of jubilee. See, this is a time for the nation to once again be reconnected to God. It's a time to rest. It's a time for them to focus on their faith and their relationships. Now that we're in the, the new covenant, all right, this is we don't have to wait for 50 years. You don't have to live 50 years in prison by your past. You don't have to live 50 years or 49 years in prison in unforgiveness. Every day is jubilee in Christ. Now let me prove it though. It's one thing for me to say it. All right? I mean, I like the way it sounds, but let's... 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. In the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, everybody say now. now. When's now? now? Is the time of God's favor. Now is the what? Day of salvation. See, again, for every pain, for every failure, 
for every setback, hurt, or habit. Jesus is what? He's our jubilee. He's our jubilee. Well, you understand? You don't have to wait for you, Somebody doesn't have to come. They don't have to come. You don't, have any, you don't even have to wait for Sunday. Amen. Jubilee's what? It's come. This is what? This is the day of his favor. This is the day of salvation. Romans says today is the day of salvation. What's salvation? Salvation is deliverance. It means to help, to rescue, to prosper, to heal, to set free. I forget the seventh one. There's seven. But it's what? Today's the day of what? Salvation. Salvation. It's when? It's now. Jesus is what? He's our jubilee. Right? We have favor with God because why? Because of him. Because we're where? We're in Christ. Old things are passed away. What? Your old debts? Your old pain? Your old unforgiveness? Old habits? Old sin? But what? Today's the day of what? Salvation. Salvation. See, again, we have setbacks in life. We've stumbled, and, and here's the great news. I'm, I, I, you know, you, you never want to act like you're trying to give people liberty to fail. Isn't that right? Yeah. Don't want to give anybody liberty to fail, but at the same time, if you fail, righteous man might fall, but he'd get back up. Isn't that right? And, he, and he'd get back up. Why? Because he still wants to restore you. He's still looking to give you rest from that burden. He still wants you to cast that care upon him. He still wants you to find freedom from that prison. Ever pain, ever failure, ever setback, hurt, or habit. Jesus is what? He's our He's a Jubilee. Now look at this in Isaiah. We didn't read it at Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on, on me. This is Jesus speaking. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the, the brokenhearted. And do you understand, you understand how inclusive that is? How many, you know, you, you've, just, you've, you've suffered a terrible loss in some area of your life, but he's come to what? To bind up the brokenhearted. To proclaim freedom for the captives, to release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, once again, Jubilee. Now look at this. When Jesus, all right, when we read it in Luke 4.18, he stops mid-sentence in verse 2. Notice what he doesn't say. Let's bring it up. Isaiah? There we go. One more. Go to the next. Hi. He says, I come to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkened prisoner, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, no, no, no look at He stopped mid-sentence in the day of vengeance of our God. Why does he stop there? Well, because that's where you and I live. We live... Between the comma. See, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and, but see, and's not started yet. One of these days he's coming, and he will judge the world. We don't live in a day of vengeance. We live in a day of favor. Favor. See, we live in a time where God smiles upon us. He doesn't give us what he, we deserve. He delivers us from what we deserve. Punishment, he's going to take at Calvary. But there's a day he's coming. Right? When he returns, he'll come like a lion and a king. Right? There is a day of vengeance. The good news for you, it's not this day. It's not this day. He's a just God. There'll be a day for everybody to, for, for there to be a reckoning. 
In the meantime, he's given everybody every ample opportunity he possibly can. To what? To find restoration. To get forgiveness. And to find rest. Again, there's what? There's a pardon for you and I. You live in the day of favor. You live there. We don't want to miss that day. The Bible says, you know, the, it's much later than you think. The day's far spent. The time is at hand. See, we live in a day of favor. But God doesn't want us to miss it. It's which day? It's this day. It's today. Wherever you're at in life, whatever struggle might be present, we serve a God that what? That restores. You're brokenhearted, He heals. You find yourself bound, maybe if he's even by your own bad choices, but you want free, He sets free. You find yourself, and even, even if your you're, you're poor is a financial issue, he'll help you. He'll meet your need. But if spiritually you're lacking, you're wanting, he's got good news. You don't have to be spiritually poor no more. He's chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. See, it's what? It's jubilee. It's a time of what? of restoration, and a time of rest. Jesus, once again, is on a mission. And his mission is to see you set free. Amen? Amen. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You might be here this morning, and maybe you've never made a decision concerning the person of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you these questions. Can you believe, we've just celebrated Christmas, can you believe that Jesus came into this world, God's own Son? Can you believe that He is God's Son? And if you'd say yes, I'd say you believe a good thing. But just believing that won't save you. Do you believe He lived a sinless life? And, and if you could say yes, I'd say you believe a good thing. You're still left wanting, though. If I would ask you do, you, do you, do you believe that he died on the cross and that he died for your sin? And if you said yes, and I'd say, wow, that's a good place. But you, you still have need of something. Do you believe that he was raised from the dead? Man, that's important to believe. You'd say, yeah. That's like wonderful. You believe all the right things. But there's still something you have to do. See, those are all things he did. There is something that you have to do. See, the Bible says, For as many that believe in him, to them he gives the power, the right or the ability to become the sons of God. Then we go to Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth, say with your mouth, Lord Jesus. Everybody say, Lord Jesus. So you can believe all those things about him, but not ask him to be Lord of your life, and you would not be saved, because this is how you get saved. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart we believe, with the mouth the confession is made. You must declare with your mouth, believe in your heart, that Jesus is not only the sinless Son of God raised from the dead, but you must call him your Lord. You have to surrender your, your life to him. You, you give up all your rights. But when you give it up, you get a tremendous amount of freedom with it. You must ask him to forgive you, to accept you, to cleanse you. We're going to pray. We're going to invite everybody in the room to pray with us. Let's do this together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, you understand the Bible says we can pray one for another. Jesus comes into our lives by invitation. Confessing it, saying it, praying it is one of the ways to do it. Say this with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son Jesus. I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. 
I believe that he died for me. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you as my Lord. Take control of my life. Save me. I accept you now. I surrender to your control and your Lordship. Jesus, you're my Lord. God, you're my Father. Thank you for accepting me and saving me. In Jesus' name, amen.